Now we'd like to welcome back up to the stage, Dr. Rosenfeld. Well, two very tough acts to follow, but uh, I'll try. Well, I'm going to be talking about a, a, what I think is a really cool topic, and, and that's about type 2 diabetes and getting people into complete remission just through diet. And this is a project I spent about 18 months with the American College of Lifestyle Medicine working on. It's, uh, I actually have the final page proofs, which will be published probably in the next few days in the American Journal of Lifestyle Medicine. But uh, really an interesting topic that, that I thoroughly enjoyed. Uh, uh, you know, and, and the motivation for this is diabetes. We are a sick nation. We have lots of diabetes, and it's going way up every year. You know, currently, it's about one in seven adults have diabetes. It's predicted to get much higher in the next few years. Um, and uh, many of these people don't even know they have it. So it, it's a real problem, and it's going up, up, up. Nutrition therapy is nothing new. There's a field called medical nutrition therapy for diabetes, but when you talk about it, and here's a typical consensus report, um, where they talk about it, yeah, it, it's going to really help you, you know, with your um, uh, glycemic control, it may reduce your meds, it may help you lose a little weight, maybe your cholesterol will go down, but nowhere does it say you're going to go into full remission with diet alone. Um, it's, it's looked at as an adjuvant, basically. Uh, but the American College for Lifestyle Medicine has often viewed this as a primary therapy, and they put out a position statement a couple years ago uh, where they reviewed the literature and, and basically came to a conclusion that, yes, uh, uh, remission is the right way to go, and they found um, a number of studies that really supported the concept that with the right intense lifestyle intervention, diet, often combined with a little physical activity, you could get type 2 diabetics into full remission. Um, and they concluded that a whole food plant-based um, diet is probably the best way to do it. This got some traction, but let's face it, it's a bunch of experts get together and you could say, you know, it's a little self-serving. You get a couple of lifestyle medicine folks out there and they say, yeah, yeah, diet's great. And, you know, they are preaching to the choir. Um, you know, it was their membership. Uh, is this going to sway other people to do it? And I, I think the answer is maybe, but probably not. So we decided at American College of Lifestyle Medicine to actually take this a step further. And we convened a very multidisciplinary diverse group of folks, not just lifestyle medicine converts, to see if we could get them to agree upon the concept of diet as a real way to manage this. So this is the paper that's coming out. Um, I had the privilege of uh, leading this group and being the first author on it. Uh, and it'll be out, as I said, in the next couple of days. It'll be open access so you can download it. And I, I think it's a fascinating uh, uh, document. Uh, it took about a year and a half, and just to show you who was involved, we did have a lot of ACLM folks, uh, some of the leadership, a dietitian, a pharmacist, but we also expanded the tent to include all these folks from other groups. So we had endocrinologists, nutrition and dietetics, family physicians, the Endocrine Society, cardiology, the AHA. Uh, so this was not just a group of converts, and the goal was to see could we get all these people to actually agree that a plant-based approach and uh, diet could really, in and of itself, take diabetics and put them into remission? Or was it just these lifestyle medicine folks who were the believers? So we'll see. One of the things I insisted on doing at the start here was everybody had to disclose their dietary preferences. So everybody answered two questions. What percent of your diet is plant-based? And of that, what percent of that is whole foods or minimally processed, right? You may recall in Annals of Internal Medicine about two, three years ago, they came out with the meat guidelines, which basically said if you reduce your meat by three servings a week, 
It doesn't make a difference in your health, so eat what you want. There were 15 authors. 14 of them were heavy meat eaters, including processed meats. There was a token pescatarian on the panel. So are you going to get 14 heavy meat eaters, most of whom eat large amounts of processed meat, to come together and tell you don't eat meat? Probably not. So I thought it was important to disclose. And what we found was this was a very plant-based group. Like 95% on average were, were plant-based, that, that part of their diet. It actually ranged from 60 to 100%. And if you ask them whole foods or minimally processed, it was an average of about 78%. But it ranged from 15% up to 95%. So it wasn't all just whole food, plant-based folks. It was a nice, um, a, a nice group of folks. We always start in these type of projects with what's called a PICO question you know, defining what you're doing. And in this case, it was non-pregnant adults, uh, 18 or older, who had type 2 diabetes. And we were looking at interventions that were basically uh, diet, with or without other adjunctive things, but, but not with drugs. Comparisons were optional. And our, our outcome was remission, which we initially defined as normal glycemic measures for some period of time, three, six months, a year, with no active attempts to reduce your glycemic parameters through surgery or devices or drugs. Here's uh, our mayor, Eric Adams, talking about his diabetes. And uh, I think, you know, in Brooklyn in particular, we have this wonderful disease called diabesity, right? Um, which is very prevalent in, in central Brooklyn. So, uh, there's a lot of interest in reversing diabetes. We prefer the term remission because remission has implicit in it the possibility of relapse. Uh, I mean, it can happen. But um, we see a lot of some focus on remission, but as shown in this, it's anecdotal. It, it's case series, it's stories, so we were trying to bring it to the next level here. And the way we do these consensus statements, it's a scientific process. I've been doing this for 20 years in the ENT world. This was the first foray into the lifestyle world with these folks. And this was their first foray, too. We use what's called the modified Delphi method, where there's a very structured way of developing certain statements, which we then vote on from 1 to 9, agree to disagree, and see if we can achieve consensus based on meeting a threshold of agreement and the number of outliers that occur. And you'll see this in a moment. We planned on three Delphi rounds where you try and massage this. Turned out there was a fourth one because uh, as we were getting ready to publish this, the Diabetes Association came out with some material of interest. So let's look at some of the statements. So remember, these are statements upon which this diverse group agreed. And the first thing we deal with is remission. So we start by saying, um, uh, you know, it's, it's the disappearance of the signs and symptoms. But you can relapse, right? Um, it requires achieving a certain level of glycemic control for a period of time. The key words being without any bariatric surgery, other surgery, devices, drugs. And the definition here is key. So remission of type 2 diabetes in adults is defined as normal glycemic measures. So a hemoglobic A1C, or normal fasting glucose, for at least six months. OK, that's the starting point uh, uh, for this. And you'll see it says they're a mean. So remember, it goes from 1 to 9. 9 means full agreement. 1 means I don't agree at all. So pretty high levels of agreement. To reach consensus, you have to have a 7 or higher. And you have to have fewer than two outliers. So zero or one outliers. What are outliers? Those are people who are two points away from the mean. So there was pretty tight consensus on these, as shown here. Um, and, and this is methodology I've published on before in, in the ENT world. Now, at the time um, we were doing this, turns out the um, ADA was developing their own consensus uh, a product and was pretty far along. And they published this in 2021, just be, when we were finishing this up. Uh, they pulled into, uh, it was in diabetes care in 2021. 
They involve the ADA, the Endocrine Society, European Association for the Study of Diabetes, and Diabetes UK. And they came up with this consensus that remission is the most appropriate term, which we agreed with in our group. Um, they said it's a hemoglobin A1C less than 6.5%, which does include some pre-diabetics, uh, for at least three months. And they talked about glucose-lowering drugs, but um, they didn't include surgery or devices. So we adopted that uh, definition and we voted on it and came to consensus. We originally had decided upon six months, but when ADA published this, we re-polled the group and they were comfortable with three months. So that's what we're embracing as well. This really is the optimal outcome. It's an achievable goal. And diet is the cornerstone for getting there, you know. Uh, medical therapy must be accompanied by dietary management. If we go back to their position statement on this busy slide, you can see all the studies they looked at. And they had some of these well-known studies, the direct study, uh, diabetes remission, counterpoint, look ahead, um, many of which uh, looked at remission and had varying rates. Others didn't. Uh, the intervention here uh, typically was a very calorie-restricted diet for a period of time, even liquid meal replacements. Uh, followed by some type of healthy eating pattern, often with some uh, exercise. The ability of a diet to get someone in, it's determined by the intensity. So if you just have someone eat a few extra whole grains and get a little flexitarian, it probably won't make a difference. They really do need to get into a fairly uh, low energy, restricted uh, calories initially to get this going. And uh, you can do that in various ways. We agreed that unrefined carbs are the way to go. And that a whole food plant-based diet is probably the best way to go. And this was touched on before. You know, the whole grains, the legumes, the, the nuts, the seeds, the vegetables, the fruits, uh, things that are minimally processed. Of course, if you take a potato and cut it up, you're processing it, right? I mean, that's minimally processed. So. Uh, to be completely unprocessed would be a little difficult. Um, these are some of the diets that might fit into this category. You know, the hypertension diet dash Mediterranean, which uses olive oil. By the way, olive oil, the only reason it shows health benefits in these diets is because they've eliminated other bad things, but olive oil in itself is pure calories it does not have a health benefit, and, and some studies suggest it's inflammatory. Uh, vegan is nice, but it's possible to be a junk food vegan, so you know, it's really more this whole food plant-based vegan. Uh, there was some discussion about whether this low-fat component was necessary, but there wasn't consensus uh, uh, on it. So this, uh, uh, this can sustain remission once you're there. And uh, we do recommend these healthy interventions, not uh, you know, just looking at strictly calories, um, which can be a little deceptive. It's not just caloric density, it's nutrient density you need to uh, uh, worry about. And some of these uh, you know, diets that are in favor now, these low carb, high fat diets, actually have a lot of problems. And in particular, the, uh, you know, the keto diet, which emphasizes all, you know, bacon for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and you know, butter and all that, uh, you may lose weight because you're eliminating the refined carbs initially, and you may get some early glycemic control, but it doesn't last. And it has a lot of uh, potential adverse effects in the long term. Paleo is interesting because the real paleo diet was actually very plant-based and healthy, high in fiber, but the current version is basically a lot of junk food in there. So uh, these, these things may get you going, but they're not healthy for long-term uh, uh, sustenance. A few other things that were mentioned um, in our consensus uh, uh, product about lifestyle behaviors, de-escalation, self-management is really important to sustain this in uh, diabetes care. Man managing and measuring your own glucose levels. There are some social determinants, cultural influences, um, et cetera. So to sum this up, the conclusion of this, and 
I think we reached consensus on about 60 or 70 statements. We started with about 130, so there were quite a few that didn't reach consensus, and they're in the article in a, a sub, in a um, online table. But to me, it was amazing that we got this diverse group with diverse dietary patterns to agree on this. You know, it's the first time I'm aware of that this degree of diversity has said, yes, you can put many adults with type 2 diabetes into full remission just with diet alone. That's a unique finding. Um, so the preferred recommendation is you're going to go on this high nutrient but you know, low calorie density diet for a couple of weeks to get going with weight loss. And it's not the uh, amount of weight that we agreed upon. What we agreed upon is that it's a percentage of weight loss that's important, typically between 5 and 15 percent. If you can drop that, you're going to do well. But to say arbitrarily you've got to lose 5 pounds, 10 pounds, 15 pounds makes no sense. You're going to eat that whole food plant-based diet and uh, follow some of these other lifestyle interventions perhaps, particularly a little physical activity. And uh, you know, that, that sort of ties it up, but for me this was really a, a, a fun thing to, uh, to do. And um, we, we did end up getting endorsed by a couple of folks. So it's endorsed by the American Association of Clinical Endocrinology. It's supported by the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, and it is co-sponsored by the Endocrine Society. So there, now you know it's real. All right. Thanks for your attention. Happy to entertain any uh, questions. Or comments. Hi. Yes. Um, thank you so much. I'm enjoying this conference imme immensely. I just wanted to get some clarity on the use of oil. So you just mentioned that olive oil was not healthy. What about avocado oils and other oils uh, in that category? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So oils are a bit controversial. In, in the whole food plant-based world, there are some advocates of avocado oil or avocados or even olive oil. Um, so the jury's out. But in general, the consensus seems to be if you're using the oil for flavoring, so you've prepared your food, you want to add a little extra virgin olive oil or avocado oil or something else to give it a little zest and flavor, fine. But to cook with the oils is not a great idea. It adds calories, it's unnecessary. I can caramelize onions, cook anything I want without oil, okay? You don't need it. You need a good nonstick pan, not the second one that uh, Batiste showed, but a good nonstick pan, a little water or broth and you can do it. But uh, oils are fundamentally just nine calories per gram of fat. That is it. So uh, a little flavoring, yes, but for cooking, no. Thank you. Thank you so much for your research. I have a question when we're working with clients. How rapidly would they be able to see a change in their blood glucose levels if they were able mm. to do a whole food plant-based diet? It's a, it's a good question, and it can be pretty rapid. In some of these studies, you know, direct, look-ahead, counterpoint, um, especially if they're using very low caloric way to get going, such as some liquid supplements or a very low calorie, you know, energy-restricted diet, you can see changes in a couple of weeks. I mean, and they've measured insulin resistance and fatty deposits in the liver and other organs, and, and you see changes very quickly. Um, and I think once you get going, you can then transition to a more sustainable whole food plant-based diet, preferably with uh, not a lot of fat in it. But uh, the results are quick, and the weight loss comes quickly, particularly for people who are overweight. You know, obesity and uh, overweight, roughly about two-thirds of the U.S. population now is either overweight or obese. And if you look among type 2 diabetics in particular, it's about 85%. So um, the weight loss comes quickly and the results come quickly. You don't have to wait a year. Okay, thank you for this consensus statement. Uh, uh, with uh, fr frying, you know, it's not simply the uh, calories, but uh, there are also advanced uh, glycated products, uh, mm -hmm. right? So can you comment about it? And is there a difference between poly frying with polyunsaturated uh, uh, you know, oils versus saturated fat oils? So I think the glycosylated end products that were, were mentioned are going to come with any type of, you know, high heat, whether it's frying or even, you know, roasting. If you roast a sweet potato, you get a little more of the, the uh, advanced uh, uh, glycosylated end products in there. It's not a lot, but it's a little. 
Uh, so it's the heat. I don't think the type of oil will influence that a lot, but the, um, uh, the saturated fat oils are going to create additional problems for you with the saturated fats and, and heart disease. So, um, you know, use as little as possible. But um, you can cook anything without oil. You can roast on parchment paper. You don't need any oil. You can air fry without oil. You can saute in broth, in water, uh, with a good nonstick pan. You can cook essentially, I've caramelized onions, cook them for an hour until they're sweet as can be just by adding a little water periodically. So it, it's really unnecessary. I guess if you're going to do it, you're better off with the polyunsaturated, but uh, I would still keep it as low as possible. Great presentation. Um, can you just speak a little bit on the time-restricted feeding oh, yeah. um, portion? I know there was that recent New England Journal of Medicine mm -hmm. article that seems to be being quoted everywhere, especially, um, specifically, I know my patients have quoted it, so if you could just speak yeah. a little bit to that. So it's about uh, time-restricted feeding, intermittent fasting, which is um, instead of, uh, as we say in Brooklyn, noshing throughout the day, um, <laughs> you know, trying to keep it a little more contained. So you might have breakfast at eight or nine o'clock, you might have dinner at five or six, and then nothing in between. So you're essentially fasting for about 12, 14, 15 hours. So yes, there is pretty good evidence that combining this time-restricted diet or some intermittent fasting with a healthy whole food plant-based approach gives you good evidence. What I didn't discuss here is a number of the people on the panel uh, have active practices where they've been managing type 2 diabetics, some of whom John Kelly in particular at, uh, in California has done this with uh, time-restricted feeding. And they've had excellent results. And they actually submitted their results in a structured way for us to look at. Uh, so it's an excellent addition. If you, and, and you don't have to cram it all into six hours. You can spread it out, but just not over 24 hours. You know, 12, 15 hours and the rest you don't eat. And, it's good for your health. Like you said, the New England Journal article really outlined a lot of benefits of, uh, of intermittent fasting. Thank you for bringing that up. That lovely presentation, and I appreciate all your information, but I was told that soy process food is just as bad like any other meat that are uh, boiled, parched, browned, stew, whatever, but you should eat the protein from the soy bean itself. Is it true that soy is just as bad without, with the process being done to it? Sure. So, no, soy is not bad in itself. So if you're eating soy, I think this will be the last question that we need. You can come up. Then, yeah, then we'll move on. Uh, but soy in terms of tofu, you know, tempeh, edamame, you know, these things are very healthy. Once you get into hydrolyzed soy protein, like Impossible Burgers, you know, Beyond Burgers, all these things, that's not good for you. You know, so that heavily ultra-processed soy where they're just extracting out the protein is, it's not as bad as eating meat protein, but it's, it, it's not that good. And those products often contain a lot of salt as well. So it's not the soy, it's the processing and the salt and all the garbage that gets put in there. But Tempeh is one of the greatest things. I mean, loaded with fiber and protein, uh, better than soy even than, uh, you know, just tofu. Um, and edamame is great too. Yeah, last question. Thank you. Uh, and I want to say thank you for your time, Dr. Rosenfeld. I think one of the things I wanted to address was in your uh, presentation, you talked about fruits, seeds, and different parts of the plant. And, you know, we're generally we're avoiding talking about roots because they're higher in starches. But a lot of my participants that I work with in council have plantains be a large part of their diet. And I've found it hard to find a consensus. Like some of my colleagues have said that each person individually should check their blood glucose mm -hmm. after they eat the plantains. And that's the best way since they are also high in fiber. But I'm curious if you have a more specific one because it's such a large part of the demographics that I work with. And I want to highlight it because it does have fiber, but it is also very starchy. So I'm curious if you have a right. on that. So you're absolutely, if you want people to adopt this approach, it has to fit into the culture. And a lot of, there are certain foods, there are certain spices, ways to do it. Uh, but plantains are starchy, just like corn and potatoes. Uh, and they tend to be typically fried, uh, pan-fried, deep-fried. So 
I don't have data on it, but to me, plantains would be fine if you either air fried them or roasted them on some parchment paper without oil. And I mean, they caramelize nicely. Okay, you're adding a few AGEs to it if you air fry it or roast it, but I, I think it's trivial. So I wouldn't eliminate plantains. I just wouldn't fry them or pan fry them or deep fry them, you know, roast them or air fry them. All right, thanks. One more thing before lunch, so hang in there. <laughs>